I'm really excited that we have Jenny Allen here from Vancouver, Washington. She is the very first person that I heard speak when I went to a women's ministries retreat. And she won my heart to women's ministries and to God and to her. And we just had an amazing weekend. And so I know that each of you will get to know her better this week as she speaks. And your hearts will be warm to her and to God most of all. She loves the Lord. And it shows in every word that she says. And she has a wonderful prayer life with him and relationship with him. And we can have a lot to learn from her about her relationship with God and in her life. And so I'm really, really happy that she's here and um, that we get to know her better this week. And her husband is here as well. If you um, go to the auditorium at 9 in the morning before this one, you get to hear him talk about translations. And then in the afternoon, I don't remember the time, but... Two o'clock, okay, he has an, another seminar about Romans, and so you don't want to miss those either. We're just happy to have them here, and I know God's going to richly bless her. Will you please bow your heads with me in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time of fellowship that we have with you and with each other. Help our hearts to be open to your Holy Spirit as you lead and guide us in our lives. Please teach us and show us the ways that we should go, and help us to have compassion for one another and love for one another. And please come soon and take us to heaven with you because that's really what we want. This is just a learning place, a temporary place. This isn't what life is all about. We can't wait to be in heaven with you. Thank you for your love to us and that it never ends and that you pursue us and you chase us and that you long for us. We're so thankful for that. And please, we just know that you'll never give up on us and that just gives us so much hope. And thank you for the hope of heaven and time with you. And please be with each family member represented here, their families. I know they all have hurts and concerns. And please be with each one of them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. I just want to say that I love that last song. April, can you push this down a little bit? It's a little high. Um, that was beautiful. I haven't heard that, and I could remember the words as you were playing that, so that was beautiful. And then I want to thank the girls for their first song. Do you know what the first song was today? It's not going, oh, very good. You know what the first song you did today was? Face to Face. I have not heard that song in years. And it took me back, oh, 50 some years ago when I was a brand new junior at Broadview Academy near Chicago, Illinois. I had just become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, maybe three months before that. And it was the first month of school, the end of the month, the week of prayer. And the theme was face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I had never heard that song. Can you imagine, as a Christian, for the first time, singing those words, face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior, face-to-face -to, -face to see and know. And I can remember, and I was sitting right here, remembering what those words meant to me when I was just a young girl. I was just 15, 16 years old, and hearing that song for the first time. You know, often when I go places, it seems like the musicians will play something that I really love, something that I know God blessed me with, and that was my song today. I always feel like God had them sing that just for me. So the rest of you got to enjoy my song, but God gave that song for me today. I love the theme for camp meeting, Jesus the Master Evangelist. I love that. And today what I want to talk about is called Catch the Wind. And this is my favorite sermon to preach because I love evangelism. I'm a product of evangelism. I am standing in front of you today because somebody came to that church in Chicago and did an evangelistic series, and I was baptized as a result of that evangelistic series. So I believe in evangelism. I go to the Vancouver, Washington church, which is right across from Portland, Oregon. And 10 years ago, we were a dying church. When we had children's story, if we had three or four kids, it was a good Sabbath. We never had more than 10. And I can remember my husband saying, he was a head elder, if we don't do something, we're going to have to put a sign on our front lawn saying, here lies the Seventh-day Adventist church. And our church decided to do something about it. And we built a brand new church. And when we built the church, what we said is this, and the board voted this, we do not want a sheep steal. 
There's a lot of churches in Vancouver. There's like 10 churches close to us. And we said, we don't want to sheep steal. We want to do evangelism. We want to bring people in, not from a nearby Seventh-day Adventist church, but we want to reach new people. We are the fastest growing church in the Oregon Conference. And do you know why? We do evangelism twice a year, spring and fall. Come what may, we do a full evangelistic series. Is it always convenient? No. Is it tiring? Yes. But do we do it? Yes, because we believe in evangelism. People need to hear the good news. Amen, folks? So we believe in evangelism, and that's why today my message is called Catch the Wind. It was in the summer of 1989 that our older son, Scott, was married in Southern California. And after all the post-wedding stuff was done, we had some time to relax. And so we went to the beach there in Los Angeles. And as we were relaxing and playing in the sand, that was the first time that I ever saw trick kites. Now, do you know what I mean by trick kites, Tammy? Trick kites, you know, most kites have one string coming down from the center, and you stand there and hold the string, and that's all they do. They float in the sky. But trick kites have two strings, and they go up to each wing, and you can make them do tricks. And they swoop and soar and turn circles, and it's just magical watching them in the air. And you know, it didn't take but a few minutes, and we found ourselves in a kite store. And another few minutes, we were the proud owners of a Hawaiian spinoff. Now, for those of you that don't know trick kites, let me explain that the Hawaiian spinoff is one of the largest of the trick kites. It has a wingspan of seven or eight feet. And when it's flying in the sky, it makes a big whirring noise, and everybody looks up. You can't help but look up. The colors are brilliant as you watch it flying through the sky. You can tell I love kites. I love watching them. I'm fascinated watching the sky filled with kites of all shapes and sizes. They're brilliant in color, and they look like stained glass in the sky. Who are my kite lovers here? Any kite lovers? Yeah, a few kite lovers. Yeah, I love kites. Um, they're fascinating. Some have long tails, some have short tails, some are multiples, some are tiny, and some are huge like the Hawaiian spinoff. And because we like kites, we really like kite stores. And we can spend a couple of hours in a kite store just looking around. Uh, the kite store man will tell you about the kites. He'll tell you what's, what's hand-sewn locally. He'll tell you what comes from overseas. And he'll tell you why they're good, what takes a little wind, what takes a lot of wind. But I'm going to tell you what you already know. A kite in a kite store is no match for a kite in the sky, is it? doing what kites are meant to do. And while you're in the kite store, you're imagining what the kites look like, not hanging from the ceiling, but as they are soaring through the sky. Well, whether or not you have fallen in love with kites as I have, there's one thing that everybody in this room knows, even if you've never flown a kite. Everybody here knows you cannot fly a kite without the wind. Now, isn't that the truth? You can't fly a kite without the wind. You have to have wind. Wind is essential if kites are going to do what kites are meant to do. And the Bible says in Acts 2.2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The book of Acts is one of my favorites. Now, it wasn't always. And it didn't get on my favorites list until I sat down one day and I read the whole book in one sitting. Now, this is just my opinion, but I don't think that you can catch what was happening in the book of Acts until you read it all at one time, or at the most, two times, broken up in two parts. You can't catch the excitement, the fervor, the joy of what was happening until you read it as a whole block. Do you know what happens? Most of the time we read a chapter here, we read a chapter here, we pick out a story here, an experience here. And we don't get the picture of what was really happening in the book of Acts. So I want to encourage you to sit down some Sabbath afternoon and read the whole book of Acts in one sitting. And if you really want to enjoy it, read it in a modern translation because it comes alive with what they were doing. If you had to capsulize the book of Acts, I think you could do it in just a few words. And the first of those words would be prepare. 
Because the book of Acts starts with the people who are preparing for something, and they didn't have it all together. They didn't understand what was coming, but they knew that something was coming. If you remember in Acts 1, Jesus told them in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then if you remember what happened, right after he said this, he's taken up before them, before their very eyes, and a cloud hides him from their sight. Can you imagine being a part of that group? What would your reaction have been? Here they are, as the Bible says, looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you have seen him taken into heaven. And you know what I think? I think in one second their expressions changed. I think their hearts must have started dancing. Their laughter and their joy must have been contagious because of what the angel said. And these verses are interesting because they contain, as it were, a double promise. First, God is going to use you. And second, Jesus is coming back. Again, what would your response have been? What would you have done if you had been standing there as a part of that group? The Bible says they prepared. They prepared for the promise to be fulfilled. Acts 1.12 says they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 13 says when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And what do you think they were doing? What do you think they were doing? They were praying. And I think they were preparing. They were preparing by praying, they were preparing through praying, and they were praying to be prepared. In fact, the Bible says they all joined together constantly in what? In prayer. So we know that's what they were doing. And again in Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And what do you think they were doing in one place? What do you think they were doing? Come on, what were they doing? They were praying, and we know that. They must have been preparing their hearts for the promise they knew would come true. And they must have been praying because the Bible says in Acts 2, 2 through 4, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Can you imagine being there? And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not a few of them. Not some of them, not even most of them. How many were filled? All. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. God kept his promise. He let the fire fall. And this morning, I want to remind you that we too, you and I, must hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind in our lives if we're going to do what God means for us to do. The wind of the Holy Spirit is essential if Christians are going to do what Christians are meant to do. And you know what our part is? Our part is to be ready and waiting to catch the wind when it comes, to leave ourselves open and ready to catch the wind, just like a kite catches the wind. Please listen and hear me clearly for what I'm going to say next. It's so important. God never meant for Christians to simply decorate church pews like kites hanging in a kite. Did you get it? God never meant for us to decorate church pews like a kite in a kite store. He meant for us to catch the wind and soar, to do what Christians are meant to do. And the rest of the book of Acts, chapter 2 on, is the story of people who caught the wind of the mighty Holy Spirit, because they went on to the third step, preparing, praying, and preaching. And oh, how they preached. What were they preaching? The gospel, the good news of God's love shown through the life of his son Jesus. I love Acts 4.20. Acts 4.20 says it well, and if you do not have this marked in your Bible, mark it in your Bible, one of my favorite verses, and this is what it says. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. 
Here's the way another version puts it. We can't stop telling about the wonderful things we saw Jesus do and heard him say. And that's part of what I call the come and go philosophy of the Bible. If you have your Bible, turn to Mark 3, verses 13 to 15. The come and go philosophy of the Bible. And this is what it says. And he, talking about Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to himself those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Now, did you catch both parts of that verse? The first part is that he called. See, God's part is to call us. And who does he call? Those he wanted. That's you, isn't it? That's me. God is calling us because he wants us. And the second part of the verse says this and they came to him. God's part is to call. What is our part? To come to him when we hear his voice. Now let's go on. It says, then he appointed 12. And it tells you why he appointed them, why he called them, why he chose them. That they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. There it is, the come and go philosophy of the Bible. First is come and be with him, and second is to go out and share the good news. And you know what the coming is? The coming is the time you spend with Jesus every day. The coming is sitting at his feet in worship. The coming is getting to know him in prayer and Bible study. Whatever you want to call it, your personal time, your devotional time, I don't care what you call it, but that's what the coming is. Isn't that what the disciples did? They came and they sat at his feet, they followed him around, they spent time with him. And God calls you to come, come and spend time with him. I know you're busy, I'm busy too, but there's no greater thing that we can do, nothing of more importance than spending time with Jesus. And the second part is to go and tell, preach the word, minister to the sick, and declare war on the devil. But you know what? There's a secret in the verses that I have just read, that you have just read. And the secret is always in the sequence. First, come and be with him. And second, go out and tell. Second, go out and preach. The secret in the, se the sequence is so important because, and what I'm going to say is truth. If you try to go out and spread the good news, and if you have not been spending time with him, you don't have a message. Isn't that right? It's imperative that you first spend time with Jesus and second go out and preach. And the other part of that is, and this is truth too, Jesus never says, come and sit at my feet and get comfortable and you don't have to leave. He always says, come, and then he always says, go. Go and preach the message. Go and tell the good news. First come and then go. If you start looking for it, the come and go philosophy is found throughout the Bible. It's found in Matthew 28 three times. But remember the sequence. Jesus never says go without first saying come, and he never says come without then saying go. The secret's always in the sequence. And you may be saying, Jenny Allen, I'm not a preacher. Um, neither were the disciples when he called them, were they? And the world has never been the same because of the preaching of men who were not preachers. And what did they preach? They just told what they had seen and heard sitting at the feet of Jesus. Again, I think Acts 4.20 says it clearly. I cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. That's all preaching is. Spending so much time with Jesus that it bubbles out of you and you have to tell everybody. 1 John 1, 3 says the same thing. Again, I say, we are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. When you spend time with Jesus, you can't help but talk about it. Isn't that true? When you're spending time with him every day, you want to talk about it all the time. And that's what happened to the disciples. They couldn't stop talking about what they had seen and heard. No matter what it meant to their comfort, and the rest of their lives, they had to share. Again, I want to remind you, what everybody here knows, we have preachers all over the world who hold no credentials from this church. You know what I'm talking about? 
We have preachers, lay men and lay women, who hold no credentials from this church. But they are simply telling what they have seen and heard because God let his fire fall and the tongues of fire rested on their heads. And they have caught the mighty rushing wind of the Holy Spirit and they cannot stop talking about it. We may not all be ministers paid by the church, but we are all preachers. Amen? We're all preachers telling what we have seen and heard. You know, too often we depend on ministers to do what we ought to be doing. I think we ought to be spreading the good news so much that we keep our pastors busy in the baptistry just baptizing, don't you? What a day that would be. If we were so busy telling the good news, they didn't have time to do anything but baptize people. When we simply tell what we have seen and heard, lives will be changed. It's also true that when you've been with Jesus, people know it. That's what Acts 4.13 says. When they, talking about the people, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I know how you are. But sometimes when we look at the giants of the Bible, we say to ourselves, but that's not me. I could never do that. That's not my gift. I'm not that talented. I could never be like that person. Look again at the verse. What kind of men were they? What were they? Unschooled, ordinary men. That's what the verse said. What kind of men were they? Ordinary men. See, that's me. That's me. That's you. Unschooled, ordinary men and women. You know how Webster's defines ordinary? Common quality, rank, ability. Nothing special. Just common people in the pews. And God used 12 ordinary men to simply tell what they had seen and heard, and the world has never been the same. See, Jesus has come. Come and be with me. Sit at my feet. Listen for my voice. Get to know me. Then go on and tell the good news. And it's true that doors are opening around the world. But it's also true that doors are closing around the world. So much is happening. So what is God wanting from you and me today? To go out and tell. Come and know his heart and then go be his hands. We moved to Vancouver, Washington just about 30 years ago. We had come from Auburn Academy near Seattle, Washington. And when we moved, it was the first time I found myself without a job in a long time. I had been a boarding school nurse for, you know, two different schools. And I didn't have a job. And I saw an ad in the paper for a, a nursing job in a high school in Portland. I hadn't been in a public school since I was a sophomore in high school. But I decided to apply. And out of 250 or 300 applicants, I got one of the two jobs that were available. And I know that the reason I got the job was because God placed me there. And when I went to Roosevelt High School, I didn't know anything about the school, and it wasn't until the day before school that I found out that it was one of the two toughest schools in the whole city of Portland. There's only two schools that were considered really hard, and one of them was Roosevelt High School. When I say really hard, we had some of the toughest gangs in the whole city. We had the highest teen suicide rate. We had the worst drug problem. You can imagine, anything was bad was at Roosevelt. And when I went there, I said to God, God, I don't want to just put on Band-Aids. I don't want to just get kids to doctors or fix broken arms. I want to make a difference in the lives of these kids. I want to make an eternal difference in the lives of these kids. If you know anything at all about public school or have worked in it, you're not supposed to talk about God. You're not supposed to have spiritual or scriptural posters in your office. And I kept saying, God, open the way for me. It was the second year that I was there. And a group of us decided that we would come before school and we were going to have a prayer group, just staff and teachers and so on. We were going to have a prayer group. And we had about, oh, 25, 30 of the staff coming once a week, and we would have a prayer time praying for the kids and the teachers and praying for our school. Well, we did this for about three years, and one day some kids came to me and they said, Nurse Jenny, we know that you're doing this prayer group with the teachers. We've heard. Would you mind if some of us kids came? And I said, sure, come. And so we had about 10 kids coming to our prayer group for the rest of that year. That next September, when school started, one of those kids came and said, okay, Nurse Jenny, you taught us how to do it, because I was the leader. You taught us how to do it. We're going to have a prayer group just for the kids here at Roosevelt High School. 
And they said, we can't do this without a sponsor. So you're our sponsor, whether you know it or not. You are the sponsor of the prayer group. They didn't meet once a week. They met every single day at lunchtime, sitting in the cafeteria, where the other kids could see them, sometimes a hundred of them, praying for the student body. Amen, folks? Amen. God will allow you to make a difference if that's what you want in your heart. I wanted the kids at Roosevelt High School, no matter what kind of a home that they came from, I wanted them to know that there was a nurse who loved them, that there was a nurse who thought they were beautiful, that there was a nurse who was willing to share the love of Jesus. Come and meet the one who is the light of the world, and then go and let his light be reflected in your eyes, your face, and your hands. One summer, I had been speaking in Pennsylvania at the camp meeting. And when it was over, I was flying to South Bend, where my family would pick me up. And we had a family wedding the next day at Andrews University. So this was on a Friday. And when we got on the plane, we sat there, and we waited, and we waited. And pretty soon, they got on, that somebody got on, and they said, everybody has to get off. The pilot didn't show up. Now, I've had plane delays for a lot of reasons, but not because the pilot didn't show up. And you aren't going anywhere without a pilot. So we got off, and everybody was pretty upset. It was the beginning of the weekend. People wanted to be home. And the next morning, about 8 o'clock, all of the same group were back ready to get on a plane that they had brought in the next morning. We had to spend the night. And I can still remember, for some reason, they upgraded me to first class. Usually, I fly with everybody else. But on that particular um, flight, and I still don't know the reason, they put me in first class, except God had the reason. And I sat down, and people were kind of mad, and they were talking and saying, well, I didn't appreciate this, or I had to do this, or this, this delay was terrible. And the man right across from me, as soon as the plane got in there, he stood up, and he started talking about why he was unhappy. And his language was so bad. I mean, I've heard a lot of bad language working with kids, but I'd never heard anything quite like this. And every other word was a swear word, a bad, bad cuss word. So I'm just sitting there and looking down and not saying anything. And, and pretty soon he looked over at me and he says, well, miss, he said, uh, how about you? Did it delay your plans? And I said, well, yes. And I said, I have a family wedding today, but it's OK. It's going to be all right. He said, well, where were you? And I says, I've been at a church camp meeting in Pennsylvania. And he looked at me and he said, oh, my blankety blank, you're a preacher? <laughs> and I said, I've been preaching at Pennsylvania camp, and he says, well, what did you blankety-blank talk about? And he said, I'm really sorry that I've been blankety-blank talking this way. He couldn't get it out of his language. He said, I'm really sorry if I offended you. And I said to him, and remember, I've been working for years with teenagers who don't know God. And I said to him, it's OK. I know you're upset. And I'm not offended. You can say anything you need to say. I can listen to you. And he leaned over and he said, thank you. Now tell me what you talked about. And for the next two hours, I preached to him. And when we landed in South Bend, he said to me, I want to tell you something. And he was soft now. And he said, my wife is going to meet me at the plane, and I'm going to tell her that we're going to start going to church. He said, I want to meet this God you're talking about. Our little boys need to know Jesus. It's going to be different at our house. Thank you, Lord. Come and let him write his letter on your heart. And then you be the love letter for the world to read. Come and be as ambassador to those who need to know that a relationship with the King of Kings makes a difference. It does make a difference, doesn't it? It should make a difference. When you're in relationship with Jesus, it makes a difference how you treat the people around you. One day I was flying, I don't even remember from where, but I was flying and I was coming home and I was feeling pretty peppy. If I've been speaking some places, I'm tired when I get on the plane and I say, Lord, I need to sleep. Just let me sleep. Don't let anybody sit next to me or else let them be reading a book. I don't, I don't feel like talking. But sometimes I'm really peppy. And I was really peppy. And I said, Lord, if there's anybody I can share with, put them next.
next to me. And nobody came and sat next to me. I had two seats. I was on the island. Two seats and were empty. And the plane was almost full, and I still had two seats. And I kind of sent up a quick prayer, and I said, God, uh, maybe I'll just read a book. You didn't put anybody there. And then I saw a young girl, maybe 17, coming down the aisle. And she was a um, kind of typical worldly teenager. She had the headphones on. She had everything that you could see was tattooed or pierced or both. And she was bopping to the music coming down the aisle. And I thought, now, Lord, there's a girl that I have nothing in common with. And where do you think she sat? On the window seat right next to me. And I leaned over and said hi, and she never even heard me because her music was so loud. She never even paid attention. And then the plane turned the engines on, and we started to taxi down the runway, and I heard a very strange sound. And I couldn't figure out what it was, and I thought to myself, that sounds like a tire is leaking air, but that's not possible. So I'm looking around, trying to figure out what it is, and all of a sudden, I looked at this young girl, and she was hyperventilating. And I leaned over and I said, honey, are you OK? And she said, no, I'm not. This is only the second time I've flown, and I'm scared to death. I'm worried we're going to crash. And she says, my name is Jessica. And so being the good nurse that I am, I started telling her what to do. And I told her to, you know, how to breathe and told her all the things that would calm her down. And then I told her about God. I told her about the God who has Underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath, holding up this plane. Honey, you can relax. But every few minutes, about every five minutes or so, she'd hyperventilate again. And wouldn't you know it was a bumpy trip? And so every time we did a bump, she'd hyperventilate. And halfway through, I called the flight attendant back, and I said, um, this young girl, Jessica, is having a hard time. Is there anything that you can do to help her? And so she told her all the same things that I had told her. didn't change anything. And then she said to her, honey, this nice lady will help you. So I knew what I had to do the rest of the trip. And when we got there, I took her physically to her next gate, and I found a flight attendant, and I said to her, she's afraid, find someone that she can sit with that will take care of her. And they did. We need to let people see that it makes a difference to be in relationship with Jesus. God wants you to come and let the sweet fragrance of his life in you carry hope to a dying world. God wants you to come and catch the mighty Holy Spirit, the wind of the mighty Holy Spirit, then go out and carry the message to a lost world. God wants you to catch the wind. God wants to plant a sense of mission in your heart, no matter how young or how old you are. So many of the stories in the Bible, like the book of Acts, are alive with the sense of mission. You remember the story of Nehemiah? Nehemiah went out there and he built the wall around Jerusalem. He helped the people. He didn't have to. He was living in Susa, Shushan. He was the cupbearer to the king. He had what we would call a cush job. But when he heard the problems in, in Jerusalem, he went to Jerusalem to help solve the problem. He went because he was concerned for his brothers in the church. We have valid concerns today. Um, events and forces outside the church, events and forces inside the church. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart when I go to some churches and I see that the issues are becoming more important than the message. Did you hear what I said? The issues in some churches become more important than the message. I will never, ever, ever forget that in the early years when we went to the Vancouver church, someone told a young man that he could not partake in the communion services as a deacon unless he wore a tie. He never came back to church. He was done. Yes, I think they should wear ties. Is it the most important thing in the world? No. This young man was just beginning service to Jesus, and he left because the issue became more important than the message. Are you with me? Please hear it. We argue over drums in church when the world is dying for the message of salvation. I'm not saying some of these things aren't important, but they can't become more important 
than the message of salvation. Amen? Amen? That's what we're put here to do. That's what we're supposed to be doing. When was the last time that you wept over what was happening in your church? Do you remember in Rwanda when brothers and sisters were killing each other? Did you weep over that? Did that break your heart? Just a few years ago, um, in the state of Orissa, in India, we had a lay pastor beheaded. We had just been to India months before that, the neighboring state. He was beheaded for his faith. His mother was killed. She had watched the beheading of her son. And his wife was raped and committed suicide. That was in our Adventist papers. Did you weep? over what happened to your brothers and sisters in India? Not an easy story to listen to, but did you weep? Did it break your heart over what was happening to some of your brothers and sisters? I want to remind you that when Nehemiah heard the story of what was going on in Jerusalem, that the walls were not built, which meant there was no safety, he fasted and prayed. We don't fast and pray much anymore, do we? I can remember when I first joined this church as a teenager, we had days of fasting and prayer worldwide. We might still do it, but nobody hears much about it. I never hear about a whole church fasting and praying. One of the very first retreats that I ever spoke at was in Southern Oregon, my own, my own state. And um, there was a friend of mine, Esther Nakashima, who told me that she was coming to do the music, much as you girls are doing it. And then she said to me, Ginny, I've invited my three sisters. And she said that years earlier that her three sisters and her two brothers had left the church. And only she was a child still going to church. And she says, I've invited my three sisters. Well, you know, we get a lot of rain in Washington and Oregon. And it was a rainy weekend. It rained the whole time. And normally we pray for good weather so people can go for hikes or, you know, do something outside. But she said to me, I'm so thankful it's raining because I didn't tell them we were going to a Christian retreat. They wouldn't have come. I told them we were going camping. And it was such a primitive lodge that it was sort of like camping. So she felt OK about saying that. And it was raining so hard, they, there was no place to go, nothing to do. They, because there was nothing they could do outside, they sat in the meetings. And on Saturday night, when I made a call, all three of those sisters came forward and gave their hearts to Jesus. They stayed up all night rejoicing and singing and praying because they had two brothers, one in Chicago, one in Hawaii, who had not come back to Jesus. And that was before cell phones, just before cell phones. And about four in the morning, morning the phone rang in the lobby of this retreat center, and Esther answered it since they were the ones that were up. And when it's her brother in Chicago, and he said, all right, what are their brother sisters doing? I can't sleep. And then she said, the brother from Hawaii called and said, what are they up to? I can't sleep. And Esther told them that they had been in prayer for these two brothers most of the night. She told them what had happened. And do you know that those two brothers that night gave their hearts to Jesus? It was about maybe five years later and I was speaking in Northern California and I parked my rental car and I saw someone running, running over the grass to me and it was one of the sisters. And she said, I heard you were coming. I had to come. I said, I just want to know one thing. Are the sisters faithful? She said, oh, yes, the sisters are faithful, and so are the brothers. Now, let me tell you something. They did not give their hearts to Jesus because Jenny Allen prayed. Now, I was fortunate enough to be there and be the catalyst, but the real reason that they came to Jesus was that years ago, back in Hawaii, when those children walked away from God, they had a mother and a father who committed every Thursday to fasting and praying for their children. And all these years, they had been faithfully praying and fasting every single Thursday for their children. That's why they came to Jesus. God was honoring their prayer. Amen? Amen? What a story of fasting and praying. Why don't we do it more? I don't know. I don't understand why we don't do it more. Um, so much we could be doing. God uses us in different ways, and he uses the gifts we have to offer. 
He uses us to reach different people. He takes your experiences to reach people that I will never reach. And he uses me to reach people you will never reach. Because my father was an alcoholic, my heart forever goes out to people that were raised in that kind of a family, or people that struggle with the issue of alcoholism, or people that have it in their homes. I know what it's like as a little girl. I know what it's like to have a daddy come home that was drunk, and to hear the fighting, and to hear the plate shattering on the wall. I know what it's like to cower in bed with my sister, dreading the moment that my father would come home because he was always drunk when he came home. I know what it's like. My friends, Janet Page, Corleen Johnson, um, uh, Virginia Oliver, they know what it's like to use a husband in their very early years of marriage. And they could minister to my daughter-in-law in a way that I never could when we lost her husband, my son, when she was just a young mom. They had been there. They knew what it was like. Those of you that have had cancer, you have an understanding that I don't have no matter how hard I try. Yes, I've had relatives die with it. Yes, I've sat by their bedside as they were dying. But I haven't had cancer. Do you get it? Their experience allows them to minister in a way that I never could. And God uses not just our talents and our gifts, but he uses our experiences in life. Um, there's so much more I want to tell you, and I may pick up on this tomorrow just because there's so much I want to tell you. But I want to close with these two examples. Let me tell you that you're never too old for God to use you. When I was in Africa, I met a woman named Joyce. And Joyce was, oh, probably 70 or 75. And she kept hearing the stories of God using people. And she said, God, use me. I'm not working anymore, but I want to do something. Use me. And nothing happened. And she said, time went on. And she kept saying, God, I'm getting older. Do you plan to use me? And nothing happened. And at that time in South Africa, you had to go pick up your Social Security check every week. And so she would go down, and there were the same people in this office, and sometimes it was an hour or two before they had the checks ready, but still they would come at 8 o'clock. And so she said that one day she was sitting there, and she was thinking about the fact that God didn't use her. And she said, I felt like God said to me, Joyce, you have a captive audience. And she got up and she said to the people, I know you're as bored as I am. Would you like to hear a story? And they said yes, and she told them the story of Jesus. And within a month or two, they called her Pastor Joyce. And when someone was sick, who do you think they called? And when they had a new grandbaby that needed a baptism, who did they call? Pastor Joyce. And she said one day, she just got up to speak, and the man came to the window, and it was the first time. He said, oh, relax, the checks came early. Everybody come to the window. And they got up. And she says, I'm standing there thinking, I've got a message to share. And she said, God, these people need Daniel 7. I'm preaching on Daniel 7. Do something. And the man came back to the window and he said, false alarm, sit down. And she got to preach about Daniel 7, Pastor Joyce. I love to hear how people came to Jesus. And once when I was in New Jersey, I asked a woman. She said she was a brand new Christian. I said, how did you become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? And she said, well, it's really a funny story. She said a year or two ago, uh, my little girl was in first grade, and she had a really good friend. They were both new in school, and this little girl would come over all the time. Every day after school, she'd come over, and they'd spend some time together, or my girl would go to her house. And she said she would come with us on Sundays and go to the zoo or go shopping, but she would never, ever come on Saturday. And so one day I said to her, honey, how come you'll go with us anywhere, but you won't go any time with us? on Saturday. And the little girl, first grade, six years old, looked up and said, that's because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And the woman looked at her and he said, she said, you're a what? She'd never heard of it. And the little girl said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And the woman said, I don't know what that is. Six years old, she said, would you like a Bible study? And the woman said, how do you tell a six-year-old no? So she said, OK. And the little girl said to her, well, there's one problem. I don't read very well. 
So you'll have to do the reading in the Bible studies. And I don't know everything, but I can, you can write your question down, and I will get the answer either from my mom or my pastor. And a whole family came to Jesus, a mother, a father, the children, and other relatives by the time I met them, because a six-year-old child was willing to share Jesus. Do you want God to use you? Do you want to be used as you've never been used before? God has a work for you. And it doesn't matter how young or how old or what you think your gifts or talents or experiences are, God wants to use you. God wants to let the fire fall. He wants to let you hear the mighty rushing wind of the Holy Spirit. My question today is, are you ready for that? Would you like that more than anything else in your life? If you're saying, God, I don't know what you can do with me. I don't know. But I'm willing. If that's your prayer, will you just stand as we close in prayer? Oh, Father God, what a God you are. You don't need us. You have angels that could tell the story, story far more eloquent than we can. You have men of God dedicated to this work, and you use them. But how amazing that you want to use us, that you look down at this sanctuary, and you have a work for each one of us. Our prayer today is, Lord, use us. Use us as only you can. Oh, Father, let us make a difference because we know you. Let people see that a relationship with Jesus makes a difference in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're willing to do this. Now surprise us with how you're going to do it in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.